All right, well, can an attacker utilize this integer underflow plus truncation to take over the system? Of course they can, otherwise we wouldn't have this section. So let's go see a demo video of that, shall we? I set up my uh, JP Nimble here and attack, I'm going to attack this TI device. Before launching an attack, I'm going to show you nearby BLE devices. And you don't see anything with the name pond, but one of my neighbor has a smart refrigerator. And I'm going to use btmon to show HCI command and the uh, events to just see the states of the victim. And I'm going to attach the victim device to this host. And here, as you see, the host use all the patch, you know, to initialize the victim. So this a device is still vulnerable. Now I'm going to uh, command uh, for the victim to start scanning using the uh, HCI tool here and launching the attack over the air uh, from an actually uh, different machine. Uh, now you see the uh, some HCI event and it actually just uh, reporting the received packet to the host and uh, the attack actually succeeded because when I scan nearby device again, you see pawn, but this victim is supposed to be scanning only. So to understand this vulnerability, we have to go back and look a little bit at the type of Bluetooth low energy packets that are being sent in. And so the specification talks about advertising channel, portable data units saying there's a 16 bit header followed by a payload. You look at the header and it says there's four bits for the PDU type. Specifically, this vulnerability is in the advertisement indication PDU type, so that has to be set to zero. And then there are six bits that are used for the length. So you see, this isn't even like a full byte worth of attacker controlled length, it's only six bits. And we know that the attacker wants to cause an underflow in this case, so they need to have something that is less than six, and so she chose two. And then what's this, a payload of 4141? That looks like an acid burn, but that is not the actual payload that's used. This was just for the purposes of the slides. All right, so in the white paper, she talks about the pool, the structure of the heap memory as used on this particular Texas Instruments firmware. And she says that it organizes information into 37 pools. And specifically, she's going to focus on pool 30, chunk two. So pool 30, chunk two is going to have a data address that is going to be working as a hard-coded return address when she ultimately overflows the stack. Now the important thing to know here is that we're gonna be dealing with both heap and stack because packets come in, they get stuck here in these chunks, and then subsequently they're copied to a stack buffer, and that is the stack buffer that is gonna overflow, not the heap buffer. So any given chunk here out of these 20 chunks is gonna have four bytes of metadata, two C maximum bytes of data, and then four bytes of trailer. So we're gonna focus on that chunk two, and that's gonna be where the hard-coded return address for stack overflow is placed. Looking at this more in our typical diagram style, we've got a heap which has low addresses low, high addresses high. We've got 20 chunks. And so in order to groom this heap, it's basically a simple matter of just sending a bunch of packets in. Send some Bluetooth packets and they shall each land into this pool 30 for these allocations of this particular size. So you can see here that when it comes to grooming the heap, she chose to alternate shellcode with helper data, shellcode with helper data. And this is because she couldn't fit all of the shellcode within just these two C bytes. There was a little bit of extra data that's needed. And so the shellcode makes reference to the data on the adjacent uh, packet information. Now, specifically, we said this, she chose pool 30 chunk two as a data address that is going to be hard coded in. And so no matter what thing is used ultimately for the heap overflow, it's always going to point here and try to execute that shellcode. So what are the contents of the shellcode and helper data? So the shellcode is going to have within it a hard-coded chunk to address, which is ultimately this offset inside the shellcode is going to be used for overflowing the stack, specifically the saved return address on the stack. And this hard-coded address is going to say, when you return out of the exploited function, I want you to return and execute this code specifically at pool 30 chunk two, just a hard-coded address. 
Again, this is possible because the lack of address space layout randomization uh, in the context of this firmware, lack of non-executable uh, memory in the context of this firmware. So the exploit is somewhat simpler than what you would find on a modern operating system. After the hard-coded address is going to be the actual shell code that will execute arbitrary code that was shown to do the things in the demo video, such as causing attacker-controlled advertisements to prove that you've taken over. When it comes to the helper data, it has a very similar structure in that it's going to have a hard-coded chunk to address at a certain offset inside of the data that is going to guarantee that when, if this data was used for purposes of overflowing the stack, that it's always going to force the return to jump into this code right here. And then, like I said, because it can't fit all of the shellcode plus data into a single packet, there's a little bit of extra data that is referenced by shellcode whenever it gets invoked. So essentially the way you should think of all of these pieces of data and shellcode is that no matter which data is ultimately used to overflow the stack, they're all going to have a hard-coded return address which points at this code right here. All right, so in comes a trigger packet and the attacker doesn't control where that's going to land, but it's gonna land somewhere inside of this area and once it does, it's going to trigger the vulnerability and cause the stack buffer overflow. So where this lands affects whether it's successful in exploitation or not. And so if, for instance, the trigger packet lands clobbering over this shellcode chunk two, which everything has a hard-coded pointer to, well, that's going to you know, corrupt the data and that's going to lead to non-exploitability. Similarly, if it lands at the end here, because the trigger packet itself turns out not to be big enough to overflow the stack, you need to have data after it, which will be used as part of the overflow. And that's again why everything has the same hard-coded offset at the same offset within the data itself. Because the attacker can't control which of these is ultimately used and it needs to be adjacent to this trigger packet. So basically this is gonna come in, let's say it lands right here, then ultimately it's going to be a mem copy starting here and, over, and uh, utilizing source da sourcing data from the adjacent area, which is why if it landed here, the attacker doesn't control past here, and so that would not lead to reliable success. So from the white paper, this is what the state of things look like right before the mem copy. You've got the mem copy source, which was that packet copied onto the heap. And so we said we've got metadata, we've got 2C worth of data, trailer, and then whatever other stuff is directly adjacent to it on the heap. And so that's why there was, you know, this heap spray and this heap grooming to make sure that, you know, there was some attack control data immediately after it. So the source of the mem copy is the data on the heap. The destination of the mem copy is this 2C allocation on the stack. And the stack pointer points at the base of the allocation, but the actual mem copy is at stack pointer plus nine, so slightly offset into that. And the goal is that data from here, which is attack controlled, should smash the data from here ultimately overwriting the link register, which is the saved return address on the stack on an ARM system. So looking at that like we normally do, we've got the mem copy all keyed up and ready to buffer overflow. We've got the attack controlled uh, pointer to the data coming in from the link layer packet. We've got an attack controlled size. So trigger packet comes in. That is the thing that is referenced in the source code as the pointer to the link layer packet. That is the source of the mem copy. We've got the stack with high addresses high and low addresses low, and that has the stack pointer at the lowest location saying here's the top of the stack. And then it's got the destination for this mem copy, this stack buffer was actually at stack pointer plus nine, so that's fine. And then ultimately we're going to cause this buffer overflow to occur, let the mem copy go. And in so doing, we start corrupting things on the stack, most notably the saved return address. So this data on the stack is, you know, first coming from the trigger packet, but you can see that that actually didn't have enough data to fully overwrite the return address. That's why it had to be adjacent to some other data, which would have a hard-coded value at a hard-coded offset. No matter where this trigger packet landed, all of these little data blobs always ensured that they would have a hard-coded return address that would corrupt that, which would ultimately point there. And so they would always, whenever this function returns, it's going to return back to attack controlled code. Now, of course, there might be more reliable ways to do this than you know hard coding some specific address, but of course, this was just a proof of concept exploit, not a full weaponized thing like malware would use in the wild. So there's only one last fiddly bit before declaring success, 
and that is the notion that the buffer overflow actually occurs within an interrupt service routine. So the idea is that hardware receives a Bluetooth packet, it triggers an interrupt on the processor, processor, processor goes off and handles the packet, uh, and then it returns and you know the, the system continues to receive packets. Well, unfortunately, because of the fact that this was an integer underflow vulnerability, so the attacker doesn't completely control the size and it is a relatively large size, it's gonna be you know, on the order of FC bytes, so you know, 250 some bytes, that's going to lead to over copying of data, which unfortunately smashes data that is used by the interrupt service routine upon return. So basically, after you've corrupted the stack, you can't successfully return without causing a crash because you copied outside of the bounds of stuff you controlled. I mean, you know, probabilistically, if you had, you know, succeeded in always landing somewhere up here, then maybe, you know, that 250 some bytes would have still been a data you controlled. But because you land anywhere in here, you can't guarantee that. And consequently, uh, you can't guarantee you that what you smash way up on the stack, up at the, you know, FC range, that's corrupting the interrupt service routine. You can't control that and therefore the system would crash. So it turns out there's a relatively easy fix for this and that is the idea of just having the shellcode end with an infinite loop. So the attacker does everything they wanna do in the main shellcode and then it just loops forever. Because the system is actually multi-threaded, this will hang the thread that the attacker control, uh, that the attacker code was running in, but the system is still going to be continuing to run and so the attacker is taking control and they can still, you know, manipulate it however they want, you know, stealing keys out of memory and whatnot. So that ultimately is sufficient for purposes of proving the full control of the system.